Naomi, welcome into the podcast. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. Likewise. We're, yeah, I- I'm excited. And if you missed the intro, if you're one that like fast forwards through everything to get to the interview, uh, we're chatting with the super talented Naomi Grossman. Now, this last year has been crazy, but I've been following you on social media. It seems like you've gotten back to work and life is pretty normal for you at this point. Whatever normal is these days, I guess, is the question. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No, uh, you know, I never had a really very normal life anyway. Um, uh, You know, I uh, didn't have a day job to to miss. Uh, But, um, you know, yeah, production has come back and uh, and uh, slowly, you know, Comic Cons are coming back. So I'm starting to travel again. And so, yeah, it's starting to feel a lot more normal out there. Yeah, it has to be nice to be able to get out of the house now and be able to go to the Comic Cons and visit people and see all of your fans. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it was very lonely here with just me and like a thousand peppers in this room (laughs) for a year and a half. Yeah, I imagine. So did you do any of like the virtual type events while this was all still kind of going on? Or did you kind of just keep to yourself and work on whatever it was you were working on and then kind of decided, okay, now's the time to go back out again? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I uh, was in a movie uh, called One BR, uh, which uh, was on Netflix. Uh, actually, got to number one on Netflix last year. Um, and not surprisingly, it was. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say that. It, it was well done, but um, it. Uh, uh, I, the reason is not. Well, I, I digress. The film was about a woman who uh, was basically moved into this apartment and was like trapped inside, uh, not realizing that the, the apartment was run by a cult. And so what's better to you know, stream while you're stuck inside in a pandemic, but uh, uh, you know, a movie about a woman being stuck inside um, in her own you know, nightmare. Uh, so anyway, I ended up doing a lot of press for that. Uh, so yes, a lot of this kind of thing. Um, um, but, uh, other than that, no, you know, when people invited me for their, you know, zoom happy hour or whatever, I, I just had to opt out. Like there's nothing happy to me about, <laughs> you know, a happy hour, like, uh, you know, just sitting, drinking alone. Uh, 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 no. So, uh, I, uh, I was fairly antisocial, especially for me, who is a total like just social butterfly. Like I, I live for parties. I like I get energy from, you know, other humans. And um, so I just kind of uh, I figured, you know, if I can't have it the way I want it, I won't I won't at all. And so I, I just got busy. I really started. Um, I, I started and finished a new one woman show, uh, that I'm, you know, looking forward to doing. Uh, so it's good. I, I, you know, I'm thankfully I did not squander this time. You know, it's not like I was sitting home baking bread and doing puzzles like everyone else, not (laughs) learning how to make beer or, you know, no, no, I get it. Yeah. It's like, okay. Like only so much, you know, do it yourself things that you can do that becomes entertaining. You mentioned one BR. That was a fantastic movie. I have to tell you that was so good. And I was pleasantly surprised by it because I didn't expect that to happen. So you obviously filmed that prior to the pandemic, right? And then it came out during that time. Yeah, I guess that was uh, two, the actually Christmas of 2017. And then we did some reshoots in the summer of 2018. And then, you know, it takes a while, especially when you don't have a lot of money, um, you know, and that movie was, you know, a low, low budget movie. All the more reason why it was a surprise that it ended up d- doing so well, you know. Yeah, it was, it was a up lot against of fun. like power, you know, with, um, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. What do you do? So. Well, it did really well. It was a lot of fun. And again, it's just, you know, how Netflix makes those suggestions. And I was like, well, this looks interesting. And I actually wound up watching it a couple of times because it was just I like those types of thrillers. Yeah. So very good on that. So you mentioned you worked on a one woman play. I want to dig into this because your background is in theater. You went to Northwestern University. Uh, you're part of the Groundlings Sunday Company. 
Let's talk about that. You did theater first and then movies or th- which came first, the chicken or the egg, as far as <laughs> your uh, entrance into the, the creative world of, of film and television and things like that? Yeah, no, it was uh, theater first only because, you know, that's what there was like. I, 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 I would say, you know, when I was in at Love and Care Preschool, I uh, <laughs> played the little bear in Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And, you know, that was that was theater. So <laughs> and I did pretty much any and all theater there was to be had uh, in Denver, where I'm from. And then, uh, you know, any and all film and TV that was to be done there. But like I said, there was a lot less of that. Um, but I did, you know, regional commercials and Father Dowling Mysteries and, you know, anything that came through Colorado at the time. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I do, um, um, theater is my first love, but uh, at the end of the day, I was, I was just wanted the lights on me, <laughs> you know, I just wanted a captive audience. So, you know, had I been uh, born in Hollywood, I would have probably turned to film and TV first. Had I been from New York, it would have been the theater. Like I was just any, however I could get eyeballs on me was um, that was my MO. <laughs> was family and parents and all of that fairly supportive of this desire that you had to do this? Extremely actually very lucky. Um, my folks are both artists. My dad is an architect and my mom is a pianist. So uh, not, you know, perf- perf- performing arts per se, but uh, they both understood what it is to be impassioned by, uh, you know, art. So uh, I think, you know, obviously it, it started as just sort of a hobby, but then it was just undeniable that this was that this thing that there was no denying, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, I, I often um, equate it to being gay. <laughs> like if your kid is, you know, if your little boy's been wearing dresses since, you know, they were two and, you know, and it has no desire to let up, like maybe we should just let him do this thing. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that seems like that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And that was exactly my parents. They, there was sort of, I didn't give them any choice. Like there was never any like sit down convo, you know, um, you know, you should really think about, uh, you know, lawyering or becoming a doctor. Like it was like, well, you're kind of already an actress. So I guess you're going to be that. Yeah. Um, It's always nice when family is supportive of it. But like you say, if you're one of these types that doesn't give them a choice necessarily, they just kind of are like, well, we're going to roll with this. So, it's good though, because you have that support that you need, especially in something that is considered to be like fairly competitive uh, as far as the industry. So you got Father Dowling Mysteries, which is a throwback to a classic uh, television show. I had honestly forgotten about that until you mentioned it, because that was like he was a priest, right? And he solved mysteries. And then he had a nun that was like kind of like his sidekick that, uh, Un, that picked locks well, that was it basically right if i remember yeah. the premise <laughs> <laughs> i mean when you hear it pitched like this like you wonder how it ever got off the ground yeah i don't think that would be a reboot for this generation i think it would be really weird <laughs> it is really weird i'm listening to you now like going how did this happen <laughs> well you looking at your credits you were like a confirmation kid i think is what they labeled your character yeah like It's interesting while we're talking about this, like the type of content that is available today, like I think this last year, as negative as it can be looked at, it's also very positive for a lot of creatives like yourself, because a lot of people were able to create. And now even more so, there's all of these outlets to get content on television. But it is interesting, like how does a show like that get pitched? You know, it's like, okay, it's a priest. And uh, then at night he investigates crimes and then he's got a sidekick nun. So that was really your first taste of being on camera. So once you did that, I mean, obviously you had a knack for it early on, but then once you did that, everything just started to snowball after that, right? As far as what you did and kind of pursuing your journey as an actor. Yeah, I mean, uh... Don't get me wrong. The confirmation kid was not my best work. It, uh, <laughs> okay. She, 
she said one word father um but it made me very famous in my high school um really? oh my god yes i was you know i really could you know i was named most likely to, to succeed from that moment forward there was you know um and uh yeah but i mean to be honest, like I, I, that got me my SAG card, which um, meant, of course, I could barely, you know, really couldn't work again in Colorado anyway. But it did mean that once I moved to Los Angeles, you know, after school years later, I was that much further ahead of, you know, the rest of the gang. Um And yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I just never looked back. Like I just kind of, that's just always all I ever wanted to do. And um, I did, I took a little break. Um, my senior year, I uh, just sort of skip school for to put to be an exchange student in Argentina. Um, I shouldn't say skip school. I went to school. It just it was in a foreign country um, in a different language. Uh, but I uh, uh, for the first time ever, I did something that was not related to, uh, you know, acting. And it was honestly like the best thing I ever did for my for my acting or myself on a personal level. Um, really? So, Just as far yeah. as like kind of taking a break and cleansing the palate, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, if anything, I was like filling the will well for, you know, all the stories that I would later come home and and tell, you know, it was it turned into the my muse for my first one woman show, Girl in Argentine Landscape. Um, it uh, you know, I learned Spanish, which turned into my sort of actor survival skill. I, I became, um, you know, I was a Spanish teacher at the Playboy Mansion among a million other places. <laughs> okay. um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, waited tables at Latin nightclubs. I mean, you name it, like it, it provided me a skill that I was able to, you know, support myself uh, while I wasn't being able to support myself as an actor. Um, I mean, I, you know, I also, like just became a more interesting person. I mean, the fact is, let's face it, <laughs> a lot of this business is, you know, going to cocktail parties and uh, rubbing elbows and shaking babies and, and kissing hands. And so the fact is I, you know, I actually had, you know, adventures to, to tell. I'd, I'd, I'd had a life and, uh, you know, there's nothing more sort of repellent to industry folks than someone that can only talk about the industry. Like that's people just tune out. They just turn off. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I have, I, I had, I had a life and I, um, and I think that was really important, um, in many ways. So, yeah, I love that. It's interesting that you say that because when you are, interacting with these folks and you're dealing with things you have to have other things to talk about right especially if you're at these parties talking to other people like the last thing that they want to do like after a long day is sit around and talk shop or you as an actress like trying to pitch them on ideas and things like that you know because it's really although this is a life for a lot of people they also like to have a break and it's not just like coursing through your veins 24 seven, like just always like a comedian. They're always talking about comedy. That's different. But like for you as an actor, you like you have to be interesting to other people. So I want to talk about that because I find that very interesting. You've been in this business for a very, very long time. You've had a lot of success. Not that you would do anything over again necessarily other than what you you know said maybe if you were in LA you would have done one versus the other in a different sort of way but what was really the best piece of advice Naomi that you were given while you were sort of working your way up before like you know you kind of got hitched into this and you know before like American Horror Story something like that kind of because obviously that's a huge accomplishment and what a lot of folks know you for but you also put years and years of hard work into this as well? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, you know, I, 
I kind of like the axiom, you know, to thine own self be true. And uh, instead of, you know, chasing your tail, uh, trying to figure out what they want, uh, you know, in a given role or whatever, I, I think it's important to be true to yourself and what you have to give. You sure. know, so often we're trying to figure out like, what is it that they're looking for? What, you know, what is it that, um, and, and that could be just as an actor for in a role, or that could be, you know, as a content creator trying to, you know, sell a show or, you know, what do they want now? Is it comedies? Is it, uh, you know, beautiful people? Is it, you know, Latinos? Is it, you know, it's like, they're always looking for something, but uh, I think it's important to uh, be true to yourself and like, what is what is the story you want to tell? What is uh, what what is it that you do and do that? You know what I mean? So you know, uh, the fact is, <clears throat> like for example, I am very animated, super over the top. And um, that has been a blessing and a curse. Um, it means that, um, for, for example, when I worked as a background extra, I was not asked back. You were because, spiking the camera. I, I, yeah. I love it. I've seen that before. You know, yeah. don't, I'm like, no talking, no talking, like, Naomi. Yeah. Can you turn around? Actually, can you go like <laughs> 40 feet back? Actually, you know what? Just go, go sit and holding, you know, just dismiss her for the day. Like I was, yeah. So, right. Um, but it, it also, for that matter, meant that, you know, a lot of these sort of, de de what's the word, developmental roles, uh, which they typical typically give, you know, co-starring roles, roles that they give these, you know, developmental actors, actors that are first starting out, um, which are kind of, you know, the like, Waitress number two to the left, want fries with that. Or, you know, the, the nurse that's, you know, scalpel doctor and, and nothing more. Like pretty much just, you know, those little supporting parts that just sort of fill in, you know, they're one step up from extra. I couldn't even get those, you know. So from confirmation kid to pepper, it, it, my body of work is, uh, you know, folks can't see uh, with in a podcast, but I'm, I have, I have my fingers very close together. Uh, <laughs> this body, adi, adi was not exactly uh, all that. So um, yeah, I, I just, I wasn't getting cast in traditional ways. And the reason is just that I was not, I, I, I stuck out like a sore thumb. I couldn't just be this like wallflower type that sort of, sort of you know, disappears and, and, and fills out the, the, um, supports the, the lead and, and fills out the story. That's just not me. I kind of, I take up space. I'm loud and I'm proud and I'm, I'm a, kind of a, a, a scene stealer, you know? I mean, that's, I sounds gross when I say it, but you know what I mean? One of those people that walks in a room and you kind of can't like have to pay attention to that's me. And so, you know, I, I just, I wasn't getting those parts. And the fact is, it was, you know, it, it, it was, it tortured me. Cause I'm like, what do you, like, seriously? I can play a waitress everywhere except on TV, but like you, you won't even entrust in me the, you know, want fries with that four words, really? Uh, but, you know, the fact is that just wasn't my path. So, uh, you know, as much as I, I was really kind of trying to um, uh, force this, you know, square peg into a round hole uh, that that just, you know, I needed to find the round peg for the round pole hole. You know what I mean? Like, so the fact is Pepper was really a perfect storm of a role for me because she was big enough uh, or rather required someone who was big enough. Uh, and I, I mean, big as in um, <laughs> overacting, uh, but, uh, you know, expressive enough, maybe is a better word uh, to penetrate that makeup. Right. Because had it been just some really kind of subtle, you know, TV actor, you, it might not have looked like anything. It would have just looked like, you know, rubber on a face. Uh, but, um, you know, you cast someone like me who's, you know, comes from the theater who with an improv background, who's kind of, you know, acts to the back row and uh, and yet 
you know, obviously small enough that someone like me could even get her. You know what I mean? Because if you're going to cast someone like a Kathy Bates or a Angela Bassett, you're paying for that face. Like you don't want to cover it up with prosthetics. So um, it was really, it was like a perfect type of role for me. And, um, and, you know, as much as I would have, I would have liked to play that nurse number two to the left. uh, That just wasn't my path. And, um, and I think that is important to know it to, to, to thine own self be true, figure out what it is that you're good at, you know, and, and, and don't worry about trying to be what you're not. Um, so I love it. Very I, long answer to your, no, uh, no, I, I question. I couldn't say it any better myself. I think that's <laughs> great because like, obviously this path has worked out for you because of this character pepper on American horror story. People know you for that, but then they go back and discover other things that you've done and even projects that you're working on now in your theater. So I think if I understand, as we kind of wrap here, the overarching theme is just if you are a creative person and you're sitting around waiting for the phone to ring and for people to reach out to you, forget it. You have to go out and just create and maybe people will discover you. Maybe they won't. It doesn't matter. But if you're a creative person, nothing can squelch that. Absolutely. Well, first, there's just there's no excuse for sitting around waiting. Like if you're a creator, create like, and what's to discover? No offense. Like if, if, if you haven't done anything, if you haven't created anything, like who cares, who cares? You know, I, I don't know. I just, I suppose once upon a time it was good. It was enough to be, you know, beautiful or have a fantastic rack or, you know, whatever that, and, you know, and stars sat at Formosa Cafe and were, you know, plucked from the bar stool and, uh, you know, taken to Paramount and given a three picture deal. But like that doesn't happen anymore. No, <laughs> you, you know, uh, they, they, and it's not enough to just be creative. You actually need to have a, you know, project to, to show for yourself. So but also we have so many tools to make that happen. I mean, it, we all have like a, a, a literally a, can, a you know, a, we could be, we're all like mini cinematographers, like from our own pocket. So, you know, there's just no excuse. And there's so many outlets for it. I mean, my God, like I, how, I don't even know how many networks there are, not to mention like s- streaming. I mean, it's just, and, and you're not even uh, limited to that. Like, what about, you know, TikTok and, you know, all these other um, platforms. I mean, how long are we even going to be watching TV anymore? I don't know. There's too many other ways to to uh, express your, you know, creativity. So um, we're so lucky because, you know, once upon a time, you know, not only did you have to like have that great rack and be sitting on that bar stool at the right place at the right time. Um, but, you know, there were just the, the like what handful of, of um, networks out there to, to be on TV. There was like the three or whatever. And yeah. now it's like throw a rock and you'll hit a studio head. So yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still don't have my my own show, so I make it sound like it's so easy, but um, it is so easy to create and we really don't have any excuse. Yeah. Well, no, no, I don't think there's a misinterpretation of the message. <laughs> like, obviously, you've had a very successful career it, from my perspective. And yes, gone are the days, you know, I was listening to Marion Ross, you know, Mrs. C from Happy Days. Tell me this story about that same situation, this young 17 year old girl sitting at a bar stool at the restaurant with all these movie stars and they come down and, you know, you know, it's it's not like the Clint Eastwoods who are with Warner Brothers for 90 years or whatever. I mean, those types of things just don't happen, you know, or we get this persona like this TV show Entourage, where it's just like this thing. And although it might have been that way in that time period, time period, now it's like there is no excuse to just get out there and create things. And it's great. I mean, you've gotten a lot of recognition from other folks like Screen Rant, The Rap, MTV, 
A lot of people have recognized you for your hard work. And of course, American Horror Story, which is great, which has just stood the test of time, going even before your appearance to then to now and to what's coming in the future. Like it's a show that kind of takes maybe some people who aren't super popular or people who we may not be familiar with, but are still celebrity level. And it gives them an opportunity to really be something. I think the show itself outside of the storylines, it, it's something that's always new in, in creating itself. One last question as we, as we finish, I want to talk about that quickly, your experience with AHS and just kind of like how that time is meant to you and sort of what, what that was like for you as an actress to be able to just land such an iconic role like Pepper, who, by the way, you've got a million pictures of her behind you. We'll, we'll post pictures so people can see uh, your homage to your character or yourself, which I love. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I've been busted for this before. I, I remember once having a gentleman suitor come over and was like, wow, you have like a hundred thousand photos of yourself in a room. But I I'm like, no, listen, it's no different than you, you know, have a trophy room in your house or you've got, you know, the the deer and antelope you hunted, like their heads on the wall. Like these are my, you know, my art inspired others art. And, um, and this is like a place I go to kind of feel good about myself. Love it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he didn't get a second date. Um, uh, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot your question. Uh, well, you were talking about it being, you know, this iconic role and what that was like. I think, I mean, the fact is, I, uh, you know, uh, b b <laughs> iconic role, that's something that the, the audience decides. Like, I would have no idea. Like, going in, I just, well, f quite frankly, I thought I was just a um, one of like an army of pinheads. Like, I didn't understand why you would pay little old me who'd barely worked since father dowling to you know top of show to shave my head and play the like the most batshit crazy on the m asylum when you've got like dozens of big names in even itty bitty roles uh in, in that show you know they killed off adam levine in the first five minutes like what are they thinking you know like what do you want with, if you're doing that to him in the first five well, i don't even want to know what you're going to do to me but um yeah I, I like i said i being an icon or whatever that was definitely the furthest thing from my mind and it still is for that matter but um obviously that would be super gross. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just something that like the audience decides, you know, like, uh, you know, I just do my work, you know, I just show up and sit back and let them glue all the rubber on. And, and then I, you know, say my, you know, grunt my couple of <laughs> lines per episode and, uh, you know, and, I think especially when you watch those that first couple episodes of the of Asylum, you can kind of see it's almost like they threw just like a ton of like whack jobs in a day room and saw what stuck. You know what I mean? Like it could have been the ne necrophiliac. It could have been the Asperger's. It could have been, the you know, there was all kinds of whack wackadoos in there. And, you know, for whatever reason, Peppers, what kind of stuck? Uh, and that's I mean, great for me. But um, yeah, it's definitely one of those things where I, I, I don't think we we don't get a say. You know, it's it is a dialogue th between the you know creators and uh, uh, audience. You know, at the end of the day, they really resonated with Pepper. And luckily, we are living in this time where we have social media and people are able to you know click like on the things that they do. And, and, um, and, you know, they gave me, gave me more, they brought me back from the alien invasion and, and then for a whole second season and, and then even back, you know, for a subsequent seasons. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was a really exciting journey. And, um, in fact, it's even, uh, it's, it's even, um, 
uh, inspired my next solo show, which I told you about, which I wrote during quarantine, uh, which I can tease a little, which is called American Horror Story. Um, so W H O R E. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things where, you know, I, again, I'm a creative at the end of the day and, um, these things, you know, my, the, my experiences are my muse and, uh, you know, if I were a realtor or dentist, they would be kind of lost. Uh, but fortunately I, you know, I've, uh, I'm a decent writer and, um, I, I'm able to kind of put them on paper and turn them into something. So, yeah. So I think I answered your question, but, um, you know, the details of that special time in my life are all in the new show. So you I have love to it. check that out. Yes. So there we have it. A cliffhanger, a great way to end the episode. I'm excited to see what is coming out. And if you haven't seen American Horror Story, you need to. I think it's available on Netflix to stream. You can see Naomi, our fantastic guest in her show. And at a coming to a Comic Con near you. If you're ever in the Bay Area, we'll have to definitely connect. And uh, I love it. Naomi, thanks for joining me this afternoon. I appreciate it. A wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>